Father, we just want to bless your name this morning. We are so grateful, my God, that we are alive and that we are here to worship you. We welcome the Holy Spirit and the hosts of heaven who are with us this morning. Father, we ask that you grant us a hearing ear and an understanding mind. Father, that we are not forever hearing and never understanding. But Father, that Lord, your words that will go out of your mouth will not return to you void, but that you will accomplish in our hearts and in our minds this morning everything that you desire to accomplish. In the mighty name of Jesus, we give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Good morning, church. Good morning. How are you this morning? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You know, God is so amazing. Uh, my message today is walk by faith. Walk by faith. And God's already given you the scripture. Don't waver. Don't waver. In whatever you do, don't waver. It's amazing that... Uh, you know, we, we lament when trials come, when problems come, situations arise. We are lamenting. Like after the conference, there's been quite a number of people who have been unwell and things have happened to people. And then we lament, oh dear, the enemy is at work. The enemy is working. We are lamenting. But this morning, God wants us to become aware that God deliberately lives, leads you into a trap like he did with Israel. He led them into the Red Sea on purpose, knowing there would be mountains and the enemy behind he put them there not to destroy them, but he put them there to show them his power and to show them his glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Let's turn our Bibles to Romans chapter 1, verse 17. Romans chapter 1, verse 17. We will not be distracted this morning by the disturbance with cars outside. Amen. We want to focus because the Lord has a word that is very, very important. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Amen? The just shall live by faith. But you know, I think the, the battle is in us taking the word and then putting that word into practice. That's where the struggle is. The just shall live by faith. What does it mean to you to live by faith? 
what exactly when you read the just shall live by faith and you tell yourself i am justified in christ so i am the just and i must live by faith what is it what does it mean to live by faith it means every day no matter what you have you must have that confidence that God is a good God. Amen. Every single day, no matter what happens your way, you must have the confidence that God loves you, that God is a good God, that God is able. You know, as I was meditating on it, I was taken back to the day that Moses met God in the wilderness through the burning bush. God has a job for Moses to do. He wants Moses to be the deliverer of Israel. Just look at it this way. Moses lived in Egypt, grew up in Egypt, in the house of Pharaoh, with the Pharaoh's magicians, with Pharaoh's wizards, with Pharaoh's witches, Moses knew the strength of witchcraft in Egypt. Moses knew the power of those magicians in Egypt. He wasn't thinking or assuming he lived there. He was in the house. He saw them function. He saw them operate. Moses had first-hand knowledge about the evil in Egypt. And now God is saying, Moses, I want you to go back to Egypt and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Now think, if it were you and you were Moses, what would come into your mind? I know those magicians in Egypt. I know the wizards. I know how powerful they are. I know what they are capable of doing. So God, if you are sending me to go and challenge those people, you better tell me, who shall I say sent me? In other words, he's asking, who are you, God? What do you have that I can use to challenge? What are you sending me with? That's why he's asking, who shall I say sent me? He wants to know what power is behind you, God, that can challenge the power that is in Egypt. God understood the question that Moses was asking. Why am I saying that? Because then God says, Moses, put your arm, your, your, your hand in your armpit. And he did. And then he says, take it out. And it was leprous. Moses looked and, oh my goodness. Then he says, put it back. Take it out again. And it was normal. Then God reinforces, throw your rod on the ground. And suddenly, a serpent started running around. These are things Moses has seen in Egypt. That's what the magicians were doing in Egypt. So Moses is looking, and then he says, well, grab it by the tail. And he picks it up by the tail, and he's back into his road again. What am I telling you this morning? Is that God did not send a doubting Thomas to deliver people out of Egypt. God had to first deal with Moses and instill in him the hope, the faith, the belief, the understanding that God is more powerful than all the magicians of Egypt. Only when Moses came to that belief, came to that understanding, was Moses ready now to go back to Egypt. What is the problem with the church today? 
The problem is that we have not seen the power of God. We have not understood the ability of God, but we have seen the power of rich doctors, and we understand what evil looks like in the world. And now, when we are going into the world, God says, go back into the world and tell Satan, let my people go. You are going back into the world, but you are trembling on the inside because you know you know what you know you see i was also looking at elisha and gehazi the servant the servant wakes up in the morning and looks the enemy army he surrounded them he must must wake up we are done for we are surrounded He's expecting the man of God. I mean, that's what we would have reacted. Oh my God, we are in trouble. God, where are you? Lord, help. No reaction from Elisha. No reaction. And Gehazi is wondering, why, Master? Why are you so peaceful when we are in trouble? Why aren't you panicking? Why aren't you doing something? Elijah says, Lord, please, I'm tired. Can you just give him a glimpse of what I know? Let him see what I see. And suddenly his eyes were open. <laughs> and he saw angels everywhere. You know, some of us have the idea that the devil is so powerful that, you know, he, he owns the whole world, he's everywhere in the world. You know, when the devil fell out of heaven, he only took one third of the angels. So where are the other two thirds? They are with God. More are they on our side than them against us. Greater is he that is within us than he that is against us. When that servant looked and saw the angels, he began to realize where the strength of the master was coming from. Where the boldness of the master was coming from. The Bible says the righteous are as bold as a lion. But I tell you, you will never be bold until you have been where Moses was. Until you have met with the great I am. And you have seen his power. And you have seen his glory. And you are convinced within yourself that God is able For that reason, that's why Moses was in the wilderness. That's where he met with God. And that's why after the conference, many of you found yourself in trouble with the enemy. But all you did was lament, oh dear. The enemy is hit this one, is hit that one, is hit that one. Oh, we were warned. We are now in trouble. God, the enemy is at work. And that's all we do. The enemy is doing this. The enemy is doing that. I want to tell you what the Lord is saying. The Lord is saying, be take a lesson from the time of Jericho and begin to sing. You are Jehovah. Jehovah, Jehovah. You are walking around your situation, your mountain, and you are worshiping God, Jehovah Jireh. You are worshiping God. You are my strength, Lord. When I'm weaker, you are my strength. You are worshiping God. You are speaking to God. You are walking around your walls. You are walking around your situation. You are walking around your circumstances. You are speaking to your sickness. You are speaking to your disease. You are speaking to whatever truth trial that you are going through and you are speaking the word. You are singing the word. You are worshipping the word. And suddenly the devil takes off and he's gone. You are not going to overcome when you walk by fear. You are never going to overcome. Can you imagine Moses in Egypt? Men, 
the magicians you know God knew what the magicians were going to do so here comes the serpents they are running all over the place and Moses suddenly oh I got a bigger one in my hand because God has already showed me so he is not panicking he is standing there and watching the little serpents running around and then he puts his rod on the ground and the big serpent begins to swallow them one by one and they are all disappeared gone They just shall live by faith. You can never have faith, church, unless you really, really, really know your God. Daniel said the people that know their God, they shall do exploits. The people that know their God when he's talking people that know he's not talking about people that have heard of God he's not not talking about people that have sung songs about God he's talking about people that have had a relationship that have had an understanding that have had an encounter with God where they've seen God deliver them where they've seen God do something in their lives those people will not be shaken because they know what God is able to do. When the whole of Israel was afraid of Goliath, a little boy who had seen God destroy a lion, destroy a bear, he stood up and who is this Philistine? Who is this Philistine? You know, we need people that are bold in this generation. We need people that are not fearful in this generation. We need people that understands what God is doing. People that can allow God to reveal his glory. And he will reveal it through the situations that you will go through. The circumstances that you are going through. Instead of you crying baby. Instead of you crying woof. Woof. Try worshipping. Try singing. Try praying. Do you know all these beautiful songs that we sing. Were birthed out of trouble. Somebody had a situation in their life. Somebody had a, a, a mountain. Somebody were in a valley. Someone whose life was in danger. And suddenly they stood their ground. And they began to sing, Jehovah, you are my Jehovah. You are above all things. You can do all things. They you know, songs came out of their spirit in their hour of trouble. That's why they are so anointed and so powerful because they were birthed out of fire. They were birthed out of fire. Hallelujah. Some of us don't want to go through the fire, but we want the anointing. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Hmm. You know, in Proverbs 18.21, we are told, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that have it shall eat the fruit thereof. Hmm. What do you say when things go wrong? What are the words that come out of your mouth? Oh, me, I'm, I'm just sick and tired of, of, of this. It's, it's just never changing. It's, it's never going to change. I can't deal with this anymore. Ah, it's just weakening me every day. I, I just can't face it anymore. No, I can't do with it. You are already defeated. I don't care how loud you come here and sing, I am a winner, I am a winner, when your mouth already confesses defeat. When things go wrong in our lives, we have to match 
our language, our talk with the word of God. Match your language with the scriptures. And you will be walking in faith. Hmm. My people perish for lack of knowledge. You know what came to mind is the story of Martha and Mary. You know, it's an amazing scene. Jesus comes into their home. Mary sits down with him. Martha rushes to the kitchen to prepare the food. You know, sometimes we are very quick to judge. We don't understand that what Martha was doing is what society taught her to do. Don't we do that in our homes? When visitors come, don't we start cooking and frying and making teas and... Hmm. Well, I, I, I'm afraid the pastor would say, no, because me, I forget to give you tea when you come to my house. <laughs> no, I've always forgotten to give people food. Pastor does it. He, he will see me talking and talking and talking with people. Then he gets embarrassed. He goes to the kitchen. He comes with a tray and he puts biscuits and he puts water. He puts drinks. Because me, my interest is in talking with people. I'm a Mary. I'm not a mother. Society teaches us that when visitors come, visitors don't come for your food, people. They come for your fellowship. I mean, thank God yesterday, ladies, you did brilliantly. We had wonderful fellowship. We sat and we talked and we chatted. Can you imagine if all we did was you came there and you were all in the fire trying to cook the food and then the food is ready. We come, we eat, and then we pray and we go. No fellowship, no conversations, no nothing. But many of us are doing exactly the same because that's how society has, has molded us. We do that with God. Many of us are happy to serve like Martha. We serve God in every way. You can serve God and put do it. I don't know what example I can use, but you can serve God, maybe prepare teas and cakes and bread and do everything, do Sunday school, do everything until you become so bitter because others are sitting and doing nothing. Then you start saying, well, I'm the one who's always doing the tea. I'm the one who's always bringing bread. I'm the one who's always bringing this. I'm the one who's always doing that. That's what happened to Martha. Lord, don't you care that my sister is lazy? She is doing nothing. She's leaving me to do everything. And the Lord's reply to Martha was, there's only one thing that is important in life. And Mary has chosen it. Martha didn't have the chance to get to know Jesus the way Mary did. Because Mary is asking the Lord. She wants to know everything. Lord, what do you think of this? Lord, where are you going? Lord, what are you doing? Martha is busy frying stews. Yes, the Lord needed to eat, but there's a time for everything, people. And I believe that the mothers of this world, they are the ones who are running to do ministry without any revelation, without any understanding. They are the ones messing up there and they get bitter, they get angry, they get frustrated because their sacrifice is unrewarded. In this season, The season will separate the mothers and the Marys. Because the Marys will walk by faith. But the mothers will walk in the flesh. And you know when you walk in the flesh, you won't go very far. There is a lot of offenses to pick along the way. 
a lot of offenses. Mothers are always picking up offenses. They are always offended. The people that know their God, they will do exploits. You know, someone preaching said, they were preaching in a church with 10,000 people. They said to the pastor, Pastor, what is the size of your congregation? And the pastor is looking very proudly around and say, well, we are around 10,000 or even more, a little bit less. Says, no, pastor, you got it all wrong. How many people turn up for your prayer meetings? Well, maybe 20. That's your congregation. That's your congregation. The praying people in the church, they are the people that know God. They are the people that hear from God. They are the people that are walking with God. They are the people that will walk by faith. The rest of the people are bridesmaids. There is no way you can walk with God without a prayer life. You are a mother, you are serving, but you have no fellowship with God. I hope somebody is listening. You're going to need it. This is, you know, we are not going backwards. We are moving forward fast. And where we are going is going to take a people of faith. When the enemy comes like a flood, the Bible says God lifts up a standard. But have you ever wondered what that standard is? Have you ever stopped to consider what it means? If you have a God who is so small that he fits in your pocket, then you have a problem. Many of us we want a genie. You know what a genie is? Yeah, Aladdin in a bottle. Grant me three wishes today, Lord. That's the kind of God that is in our minds. The God whose main job is to grant your wishes. Whose main job is to do what you want him to do. Children sit and don't study, don't read books, and then, Pastor, pray for me to pass my exams. There's no Aladdin. The Holy Ghost can only remind you of what you have invested. If you have read your books and you have studied and you have put your best into it, during your exam, the Lord will remind you. And all those things will come to mind and you will pass your exams. But if you sit and do nothing and then you expect God to win, you know, the magic wand and then you get A's, straight A's, then you are mistaken. It's not going to happen. He is not the God of Egypt where they do magic. Hallelujah. He is not the God of Egypt. He is the God of Israel. The God of Abraham. The God of Jacob. Ha. You know, it's amazing how many Christians fear demons. You may be laughing, but if a witch doctor walked in here, many of you you will go to the toilet very fast because you are afraid. I know a story of a young man, very zealous for the Lord, went into the village to do ministry and a witch doctor came along and said, young man, I love what you are saying. I'm giving my heart to the Lord. But as you can see who I am, I got my things. The young man was very zealous. Bring, let's burn it. And the witch doctor brought all the stuff. They make the fire. 
the young men put the things on the fire and lit the fire. And the things begin to burn. And the young man is rejoicing. But there was a problem. You see, the young man had no prayer life. The young man had no relationship with God. The young man was operating out of head knowledge. He had seen other people doing that, just like the sons of Sceva. You know, when they see Paul casting out demons, they grab a demon-possessed man, put him in the room, and close the door, and say, in the God whom Paul preaches, we command you, demon, come out. That's what the young man was doing, people. And he went home after his successful village ministry. When he walked into the house in the lounge, the fire from the witch doctor was still there, burning with all the witch doctor's things on top of it. The young man went cuckoo. He started running around screaming. He couldn't get that fire out. There was no fire. It was all here. The magic of the witch doctor. We are not playing games, church. It's the people that know their God that will do exploits for God. It's the people that are doing things in faith. Not people who are trying it out. Not people who are copying what they've seen other people do when they themselves have no relationship with God. But you see, the demon says, well, Jesus we know. Paul we know. Excuse me, who are you? Can you see the importance of sitting at the feet of Jesus, learning of him, understanding him, knowing his power, developing confidence in the word to a point where you walk in the word, you live in the word, you put the word into existence. You know, I love it when I was reading John the disciple of Jesus Christ, who was privileged to have seen Christ in person, saved under him. He saw Christ as a man, and yet in the isles of Patmos, John sees Christ as the what? The ancient of days. He sees Christ from a different perspective. Perspective, People, we need to begin to see God from a different perspective. I want to go with you to Revelation chapter 1. I love to read what John wrote about Jesus. And every time when I do deliver, when I read these things, my God, demons scream and shout and tremble because there's power. There's power. John says when he met Jesus, he saw him among the candlesticks. We will read the description of what Jesus looked like. But before then in Revelation 1 verse 8, it says, Jesus said these words, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Wow. Is that not what he said to Moses? I am. You know, even when you begin to sing these songs, Alpha and Omega, when you are singing from an understanding, when you are singing from knowledge, that song comes alive. He is my Alpha. He is my Omega. That means he is my beginning. He is my in between and my end. He, know, he knew me before I was even created. He will be with me. He will never leave me until the day I leave this world. That's what it means. God is with us. Emmanuel. God with us. And he promised, I will never leave you nor forsake you. In verse 12, John said, I turned around. To see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, 
I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man. dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. And coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all his brilliance. Listen to verse 17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Is this the God that you believe in? Is this the God of your understanding? The God that was revealed to John in the isles of Patmos, the ancient of days, Who's got eyes that blaze like fire? That John was so afraid that he fell down as if dead. Is he the God that we dance kwasa kwasa to? Is he the God that we lie every day in front of him? Is he the God that we say, Oh, the Lord sent me. Oh, the Lord said. Is it the God that we are playing games with? When John saw him, he fell on his face as if he were dead. But today the church has no fear of God because the God that we serve is a God of our imagination. It is not the God of the Bible. It is not the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. We are serving the God of Egypt, the magician. Everywhere where they saw God or the angel of the Lord, the thing they tell you is how they were so weak they could not stand. How they fell on their faces before him. Even the statue of Dagon in the temple fell flat before the power of the awesome God of heaven. The people that know God, they walk in fear. Reverence fear of who God is and what God is able to do. And when the enemy rises, they stand back and say, wow, God is about to show me his glory. Hallelujah. God is about to show me his glory. Stand and see the glory of the Lord. He wants to show you his splendor. He wants to show you how awesome is his power. He wants to show you he is the great I am. So it's not just a song. You are the great I am. But we, 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 we are singing the great God. But when we meet with trouble, the God is so small, he can fit in your pocket. Your God is the one who's hiding behind you when there's trouble. Then you are looking, where is God? Where is God gone? That means your God is so tiny, you can't even find him when you need him. But the Bible says, in others slumbers nor sleeps. 
He says his eyes run to and fro watching over the righteous and his ears are always attentive to their cry. And then he says before you called I already heard you. Before you asked I already answered you. So why are we looking everywhere for God? Oh, where is God? Oh, why is this happening to me? Why is God allowing this to happen to me? What is happening? It will keep happening to you until you rise up, until you stand in faith, until you begin to believe that God is able, until you begin to believe that God wants to show me his glory. Why? Because God loves you. He's not going to leave you in that position of unbelief and faithlessness. How are we supposed to fulfill the great commission? You know, the devil is a liar. He's, he's provided a counterfeit spirit because the church was too lazy to fast and to pray and to wait for the power to come from above. The church was too lazy to spend the time in the upper room until the Holy Ghost comes. And so what did they do? They went for the quick fix. Counterfeit spirit. We are being called to complete the great commission. Go ye out into all the world and preach the gospel. Heal the sick. You know, it, it amazed me when I read the scripture that Jesus, when he sent his disciples, you know what he say? Go two by two. When you enter into a, a village or into a house, heal all the sick in that place. That's what Jesus said. Have you entered into a house where there's sick people? And you went and say, oh, shame. Uh, can I get you paracetamol? <laughs> can I bring you fruits or, or something? Have you got your medication? Have you been to your GP? What did the GP say? You start analyzing. But Jesus said when you enter into that house and you find the sick people, heal them. That's why in every city where he went except in his own city where they did not believe, he healed all the sick that were brought to him. And another thing that caught my attention Oh, I, I went back to read the, the four Gospels just following the ministry of Jesus and I noticed one other thing. Do you know that Jesus never turned down anyone who asked him for help? Never ever. The Bible says this poor man cried and the Lord heard him and delivered him out of all his problems. Everywhere where Jesus went, the blind man cried, son of man, son of David, if you will. De Jesus said, yes, I will receive your sight. The leprous man says, master, if you will. And he says, yes, I will be thou made whole. He never turned anyone down. He never refused to heal anyone who asked him for the healing. He never did. Not once. I never found one scripture where Jesus said, Oh, I'm sorry I can't heal you because your sins are too much. He healed everyone. And that's where he is bringing us church. Well, if you don't believe... Me, I believe. I believe that we are coming to a place and to a time where we are going to walk into people's homes and heal their sick. Where we are going to walk into the office and heal the sick. Where we are going to do exactly what the word of God says. Because Jesus is coming for trees that are bearing fruit. He's not coming for barren trees. 
He wants the trees that are fruit bearing. We are called to do the works of Christ, even greater works. But until we can change our mindset and begin to see God with new eyes, begin to see God the way John saw him, the ancient of days, with a two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. Hallelujah. What a picture of a conquering God. What a picture of the one who was, the one who is, and the one who is yet to come. The almighty, the everlasting father. And that's the God that we are supposed to serve. That's the God who is calling us, come up hither. And I will talk with you. Are you willing to climb that mountain of unbelief? Climb that mountain of all the things in your life that separate you from God. You know, there are mountains in all of our lives. For some of us, our jobs are the mountain that keeps us far away from God. Some of us, it's our children that are mountains. Some of us, it's our greed that has become a mountain. You know, because we are never satisfied. It doesn't matter if they gave you a hundred hours. You will still want another hundred hours of overtime. But God is saying, come up. Are you willing to go up those mountains and say, ah, ah, I am leaving this down here. I am going up to the upper room and I am going to pray. I'm going to talk to God. I'm going to walk by faith. I'm going to believe every word that is written in the Bible. And I want to see the glory of God in the land of the living. I want to lay hands and see people recover. I want to rebuke and see demons coming out of people. I'm going to walk in power. You know, we say the theme for the year is what? We are walking in greater power and in greater authority. That's why God is speaking to us the way he is doing, church. That's why you are having problems. That's why you are experiencing difficult times. They are not there to quench the fire. They are there to make you stronger. They are there to help you to rise up and put the word into practice. Hallelujah, somebody. Let us not glorify our situations, but let us glorify God, the giver of life. That's why I'm closing now. The Bible says, whoever still loves his life is not fit to be a disciple. You have to give up your life. You have to give up your rights you have to begin to say i belong to jesus and i will go where he sends me and i will do what he tells me to do and i will say what he asks me to say regardless of the price that i might have to pay because there is a price to pay for obeying god hallelujah so you got a situation in your life things are happening and you've run out of ideas you don't know what to do anymore God is saying rise up rise up and put your problem right here and begin to do your seven times walk around your problem and tell your problem Jehovah you are my Jehovah. You are my healer. You are my deliverer. You are my salvation. You will never put me to shame. I'm the head and not the tail. I will never be put to shame because my God goes before me 
His favor walks before me and His goodness and His mercy follows me from behind and no weapon that is fashioned against me will prosper and every tongue that is raised against me is already condemned. It is already judged. Who, If God is for me, who can be against me? Hallelujah. 